Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of F-099. Wait, no. Tarvold's Quest 99. Perspective Zero? F-Quest? Okay, guys, my brain is a bit fried because I have a full-on addiction to this game. This is serious. Here, let me show you how much I've played. Oh, no. I close my eyes at night and I see a racetrack flying towards me. It's bad. Real bad. But the game itself isn't. It's amazing. And all joking aside, I've been having an incredible time with it. I wanted to make this video to try and explain what makes this game so special and prove to you why it's worth your time. Maybe not that much time, but I need to give this the retrospective treatment nonetheless. Time to be a good little boy and turn this addiction into content! Buckle up, pilots, because today we're talking about F-099. Since I got my hands on F-Zero GX back over 20 years ago, on launch day alongside Soul Calibur 2, I've been a massive fan of the F-Zero series. Yeah, that's basically my catchphrase at this point, but I just love talking about stuff I love, okay? Anywho, playing through the story mode of GX captured my soul forever. The difficulty of it, the fast-paced action, and the sense of adrenaline I got was unmatched. I wasn't even really a big racing game guy either. I played a lot of the Mario Kart series, some Diddy Kong Racing, and Extreme G on N64. Had a brief affair with Top Gear Overdrive, but aside from that, racing was a genre I never typically touched. And honestly, that's still true to this day. There's something really special about F-Zero that calls to me. The music for one, I mean, come on. Mute City, Big Blue, Port Town, Dr. Stewart's theme from GX? These tracks have such memorable melodies, the pace and tempo of them perfectly complementing the fast-paced action of whatever game they're bumping in. F-Zero X for the N64 especially has a unique sound to its music. It's very metal. Grimy ass, rusty metal at that. I feel like I walked into a biker bar and immediately got tetanus listening to some of these tracks. After I fell in love with GX, I moved backwards in the series and eventually fell in love with X as well. It didn't feel nearly as clean as GX in the controls department, but this game is seriously impressive as well. But neither of these games are what I'm here to talk about today. Yet. Moving even further back, I delved into some F-Zero on the Super Nintendo, which is the foundation that F-Zero 99 is built on. I like the SNES game a lot, but I didn't unequivocally love it like I did X and GX. It's still a very fun game, but since I was moving backwards in the series, it didn't feel nearly as tight or dynamic as X or GX to me, since it was essentially a flat 2D course. X and GX have a lot of verticality and gravity to their gameplay, which give them much more depth, literally and figuratively. The seriously impressive thing about F-Zero was that it was a launch title for the Super Nintendo along with Super Mario World, which to anyone getting the SNES on day one was absolutely mind-blowing. I tend to forgive its stiffness nowadays because of that fact alone, and that it birthed a series and characters that I've come to love, even if the series has been near the bottom of Nintendo's most popular franchises. Thank God Captain Falcon is in Smash Bros, or I don't think 99% of the people who know what F-Zero is even would know what it is without him. Come on! Forever, he will be my hero for that. Jump forward a couple decades and the Nintendo Direct hits where F-Zero 99 was revealed. And I was underwhelmed. Excited that F-Zero got any kind of spotlight at all, but was immediately disappointed that it was based on the Super Nintendo game and that it was an online only battle royale. I had a very muted reaction when streaming with some friends on the Duke of Dorks channel. Oh, uh, I oh. see. F-Zero 99. Honestly? Honestly, that's, that's actually fun. very cool. Uh, okay. 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 Well, I'm more Somehow. Why SNES though? Why SNES? I know. Because like, it's it's easier to load take 99 to sprites yeah. than 99 models. Oh, well, okay. And it's free? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. More than 30 years uh, after its original release, F-Zero is back in yeah, the Royale game. Yeah, just what we wanted. I left that direct with some very complicated feelings, thinking that one of my favorite franchises was just going to be relegated to a, wow kids, look at this retro game, so old, eh? Museum-esque novelty. Then, I started playing it. Yes! Blown! 
away like breaking Benjamin. I could not have been more wrong in my initial reaction. Holy smokes, my guys. This game is one of the most fun multiplayer experiences I've had in a long, long time, and by far the best battle royale game I've ever played. Though I don't necessarily agree that it's a battle royale. It's more just a really big race. Sure, in the race you can kill people, and there's only one winner per se, but you can still survive, earn points, and make it to the end of the race without winning or dying. To me, it's just a really congested sweat fest, like trying to get a Van Gogh Pikachu card. First thing I want to praise above all else is this game looks and runs so clean. The menus are all crisp, clear, and the UI is smooth as butter. Bam! You got the two main modes front and center with full explanations of each. Then off to the side you've got your workshop where you can fully customize your vehicles and profile, and a practice mode which allows you to drive on any track unencumbered by any other racers. It's simple, but so incredibly intuitive. That, and it modernizes the classic s style by including little bits of art from the original SNES title's instruction manual. Even Mr. Zero, who is a character in the instruction manual's short comic book, gives you hints during these short loading screens. And let me tell you, do not sleep on these hints. They let me know things that I would have never assumed on my own just playing around. If you ever miss any, you can even read through them all in the main menu. Look, I know I'm spending too much time geeking out over the menus, but it's important to me, alright? At the time of making this video, it's still very early in the lifespan of this game. I hope. I had a couple concerns when I started to do this. One being that this video will probably age badly if mechanics, modes, and any other extras are added in the future, and I 100% believe that this will be the case. But f is relevant again for the first time in ages. I couldn't possibly pass up this opportunity to gush about it. As of right now, I've unlocked everything I can aside from hitting the current level cap of 99. Except, oh wait, yes I did, I'm really slow at editing! <laughs> I've routinely been in the top 100 global rankings, and that only started going down when I tore my hands off the controller to write and create this. The game has a really fun unlockable system where you can unlock different colors, decals, and profile flair solely through playing. You get rewards for doing things like getting first place in a race or a grand prix, getting an accumulation of wins in various modes like team battle, which I'll get into later, or fun things like getting five knockouts in one race or being in absolute last place without being eliminated. It definitely works for keeping you motivated and no doubt fueled my addiction even more. If I'm gonna be playing till my eyes bleed, I better have a tiny pixelated trophy to show for it, damn it. Another concern I had with this game is, well, we live in a dark timeline where digital only games can and have disappeared permanently at the whim of those who host it. Super Mario 35 was a blast and it's dead forever. Why? We have no idea. Nintendo just decided it's only going to be available for a short amount of time and then pull it off the online infrastructure. Sure, they could bring it back at some point, but it just doesn't make sense to me as a gamer why I can't just play a video game I like when I want to. This is why I am a staunch defender of physical media. Unless there's a game that has zero chance or plans to have a physical release, I typically refuse to buy it unless I can get the physical version. F-099 is a part of the 99 series, which is directly tied to your NSO account and allows you to download and play for free, so I didn't feel too icky getting it. But now that I've fallen in love with it, I fear the day someone decides to rip it from my hands. It's like babysitting a puppy for way longer than you expected to, and then someone just comes back randomly one day and just takes it from you. How would you feel? Not very good, I imagine. I have this sinking feeling that Nintendo can take my adopted puppy at any moment, and it scares me. Tetris 99 did get a physical release bundled with a year of NSO at some point, so maybe F-099 could get the same treatment, potentially after they release all the content they have on their roadmap for the game. And Nintendo, I'd be there day one to buy it, probably twice. Give it to me, shut up, and take my money. I'd love to be proven wrong about this, and see F-099 last an eternity being played by my descendants in their Amazon-made underground bunkers. But I don't really trust big corporations with game preservation. Anywho, I think it's time to start talking about the actual gameplay. If you're looking at this footage and thinking, good god, this looks like an uncontrollable mosh pit, you're absolutely correct, to a point. It is a completely chaotic mess when you first jump in, and I'm gonna rip this band-aid off right away. If you want to get into this game, it is paramount that you accept that it has a steep learning curve. You are going to lose a lot. You are going to blow up a lot. You are going to seriously reconsider your hobbies and life decisions as your blood pressure gets so high you trigger a thermonuclear spike in your neighborhood. It's hard. Very hard. And a lot of times, it doesn't feel fair. You'll get bumped one tiny little way which will completely derail you. A red bumper might place itself so perfectly in your way that you can't help but smash teeth first into it and melt your face into the wall. You'll absolutely swear to Genova that you made it over the finish line. What the fuck, man? I blew up after this game sucks. 
But if your spirit is stalwart, your resilience is brilliant, and you have the heart of a falcon, even you can become a true F-Zero champion. It's going to take some work, some erasure of bad habits, and learning the racetracks like the back of your dick. But eventually, you'll start to have more fun. Hell, even getting totally shreked up until that point is still a blast. But let's face it, winning is more fun. You know what else was really fun and refreshing for me personally? The fact that I trained myself how to be a better driver without any online guides or meta tips. It's been a very, very long time since I've had that experience of truly getting in on a game on the ground floor and teaching myself with nothing but pure stubbornness and head slamming through the wall trial and error. It was a feeling that brought me back to the days of Halo 2, Guitar Hero 3, and well, F-Zero GX. It's such a gratifying feeling to know that you're crushing ass not because someone taught you how or by studying guides, but because you learn from your own mistakes and you put in the work. And now you get to feast on the juicy fruits of your labors. It's something that I never feel I have the time to do casually anymore. But man, this game really unlocked a sense of accomplishment in me that I so dearly missed, without even knowing that I missed it. The main mode of the game is the titular F-099. This mode is available 24-7, it, it's as simple as it sounds. It's a single race against 98 other people to see who will win. You can even see all the racers pile into the room as if it's the prep area before heading to the track. Their names, wins, skins, it's so impressive. God, this game put so much effort into the little details and I just want the creators to know it has gone noticed, is appreciated, and I'd give them a big hug if I could. F-Zero fans are few and far between, but we love loud and fast, baby. Two tracks are chosen at random from a selected pool, typically populated by the more basic racetracks in the game, and you're able to vote on which one to race on. And this next statement goes out to all of those in the 99 mode. There are other tracks besides Mute City. Good lord, please. Please vote for something else, ever. Then you're taken to the actual track, which opens with an absolutely massive parking lot style starting area. These were added onto the original tracks to add some intensity and space to the start of the race. And I love, 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 love them. Before getting into the congested mess of the tracks themselves, these starting areas are fantastic for selling the scope of the race you're in and slowly but surely build up the anticipation of the race itself. As your vehicle gains speed and you hit more boosters and ramps, you may run into a couple other vehicles, then a few more as the bottleneck tightens. Then just before you hit the start line, the entire population of the race mashes itself into an orgy of steel and speed. If that wasn't enough of an adrenaline booster shot, once you hit the start line, you got boost power. I mentioned earlier that this game was based on the SNES F-Zero, but it took a few key aspects from its future iterations that improve the gameplay tremendously. In the original game, you could only boost once after every lap using a consumable boost power-up. In X and GX, you could boost as much as you want, though it comes at the expense of your machine's power. And once this power empties out, too bad, you lost your machine. If you want to go fast, you're gonna bust your ass. This creates even more intensity and strategy to every race since, well, the fastest machine is gonna win. And boosting is faster than not boosting, duh. But it's pretty hard to win if you're a smoldering pile of dust they need to scrape off the sidewalks of Port Town. You really, and I mean really, need to have BDE in order to both survive and win any race. Boost, discipline, energy. If you just drain your power meter willy-nilly, you're going to end up dead in every race. It takes a great pilot to understand the track, the strengths and weaknesses of their machine, and the situation one finds them in to truly know the best time to boost. Sometimes you might even want to go an entire lap without boosting at all. I love the implications of this system of eating shit to get a hit. It demands constant attentiveness, spatial awareness, and split-second decision-making that makes you feel alive! Yeah! The amount of times I've used up my last little bit of power to barely squeak ahead of the competition while my smoldering machine narrowly carries my butt over the finish line is immeasurable. You also lose power for hitting walls, driving over magnets, and having other players smash into you. Meaning that if you want to maximize your power and ability to boost when you want to, you need to keep yourself 
off of the sides. Or if you're going into head-to-head -head fights with other machines, ensure that you're the one doing the damage and not getting beefed around like an air hockey puck. There's more to it than just preservation though. You can restore your power in a couple ways that add even more strategic layers to any race. Typically near the start line, whether it be before or after it, there's a pit strip that will restore your power the longer you're on it. Different tracks will have this strip be different lengths, meaning it will restore different amounts of power. So again, you need to keep that in mind when deciding when to boost. But that's the boring way to heal. The best way is cold steel murder! F-Zero as a series has always encouraged you to be the grandest prick in the free. But my lord, F-Zero 99 incentivizes this toxic mindset to the highest degree possible. Another thing added into 99 that was never in the original is the spin attack. Every once in a while you can use this attack to smash in other players and deal some damage, or knock them off the racing line. It's especially fun to knock them out of the recharge area to ensure that they don't have enough power for their next lap. You can't spam this attack though of course, it's on a cooldown timer shown here, though you can reset this cooldown immediately if you ever hit one of these ramps. Not only is this spin used for being a bully, but it's used for fighting them off as well. If you're in your spin animation, you will not take any damage from other racers. This is especially key to utilize properly when you're getting mashed up in a crowd, taking a tight congested corner, or saving your ass from exploding when you're making a mad dash to the finish line on zero power. That last part is especially clutch, since when you're down to zero power, your machine starts flashing and smoking for all to see, and you become the sweetest piece of pie that all others want to eat immediately. If you spin or boost into a competitor's machine while they're in this smoky state, you will instantly kill them and remove them from the race. Welcome, Orange! But there's more! You get a full 100% power refill instantly. But there's more! You also have your max power increased by a good amount. But there's still even more! The max power upgrades you get will carry on and stack through any mini or grand prix, meaning the more blood on your bumper, the more power you'll have in the later races, which is such a huge advantage to have over the competition. As you can imagine, this makes murdering your competition hugely important, and more importantly than that, making sure to protect yourself at all times, since you know the other racers are dying to see you, well, oh no. die. A single player KO can take a race that was impossible to win into an instant game changer. Maybe you're trailing behind with low power when suddenly you see a smoking competitor just ahead. You can use the very last of your own power to score the KO and rock it to the front of the pack by spamming boost with your massive new cache of blood energy. This is also why it's incredibly important not to get your ship to smoke status unless the race is about to end. Or if you're really close to a pit strip. This game is absolutely ruthless and I absolutely love it. Even when the vein in my neck explodes from frustration. Because there's yet another aspect to the races that add an unbelievable amount of stress, the bumpers. I don't get nearly as mad at the other racers more than these Roomba rejects. Holy shit do I hate these, but they are a necessary evil. As a race progresses through the laps, more and more of these bumpers get added to the course. There are four different kinds, silver bumpers, red bumpers, blue lucky bumpers, and the gold bumpers. Silver bumpers are actually not too bad. They follow a set path that you can easily maneuver around, and if they ever get bumped or attacked enough, they will start to flash like any player would, and you can KO them as well. You won't get a full heal, but you will still get a permanent max power boost and a small heal. They can absolutely knock you around though. They're called bumpers for a reason. One does not simply nudge a bumper. They will slam you around with the full force of your kinetic energy. Utilizing the LNR straight function is key to dodging these things without losing control. The red bumpers though. Holy shit, I hate these things. Absolutely fucking hate these things. They drive in the same way the silver bumpers do, following a set path that you can easily swerve around, but they will explode if you ever come within an inch of them and do massive damage to your machine, hurling you into the walls and completely screwing up your concentration. But it's worse than that, because if only a few of these spawned, it wouldn't be an issue. The problem is, if you're ahead in the fourth lap, they spawn armies of these! It's 
a bit overkill. I understand why this happens. It's to prevent someone ahead from just running away with the race with no competition on a clear road. It gives those behind a chance to catch up. Since they won't spawn nearly as many the further back you get in the pack, they typically spam the people in the lead with these as an equalizer. Fair enough. That doesn't stop the hot feeling in my head whenever I run into one of these. It's a bit much. Like, holy shit, I get that there needs to be a comeback mechanic. But sometimes it's just a freaking Red Rover wall blocking off the entire track. The nightmare doesn't just end when you hit one of these either. These things can slam you into other red bumpers, taking your power from 50 to zero in an instant. It's especially bad when taking a turn with three or four of these things in the way. How are you supposed to swerve around these things while turning? And they're turning as well. It's a nightmare. And if you find me dead after playing F-Zero, it's probably from a red bumper induced heart attack. Then, there's the lucky bumpers, or what I like to call the spiteful dicks who weren't good enough to win. These things are human. Seriously, if you get KO'd or ranked out of a race, there's a chance that you can become a lucky bumper, which puts you back on the track for 30 seconds to mess with the rest of the racers as much as you can to earn some extra ticket points. I'll get into that later. These things are invincible, are controlled by already pissed off losers, and can spin attack you on top of just getting in your way. One or two of these wouldn't be a problem. The real issue is when you're faced with one of the previously mentioned Red Rover Walls of Death and a lucky bumper just happens to spawn with them, meaning the human controlled spirit of vengeance can position themselves in the one clean path around the red bumpers and make it completely impossible for you to cleanly get by without losing your teeth. They don't follow any predictable paths like the silver or red bumpers, but their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. They are human, and humans can be predictable. I find that a lot of lucky bumpers will always go to the obvious spot on the track to block or bump you. And knowing that, you can typically juke around them with ease. They are also slow, so if they miss you on their first attempt, you're basically in the clear. But to reiterate, it's the mixture of all these that make my heart explode. But don't worry guys, I'm still having fun, most of the time. There's one last kind of bumper, the giant gold bumper. And this thing is beneficial to slam into, since it will shower you in super sparks. I'm sure you've noticed in the footage so far this gold bar underneath your power meter. This is the super boost. Collecting enough super sparks will allow you to do a super Super boost, which takes you to the Skyway. Time to fly. A completely safe strip in the sky that has you permanently boosting, avoiding all the other racers and bumpers, and allows you to just nope out of difficult sections of the track. Super Sparks also fly off machines colliding into each other, and when they come off the Skyway themselves, they drop a bunch to those behind them. Using the Skyway to your advantage is absolutely critical to winning. Depending on how far behind or ahead you are, the super boost meter will drain at different speeds. This feature yet again serves as a comeback mechanic. If you're well behind the pack, don't sweat it yet. The Skyway is a great way to get you back in the race. The gold bumper typically will never spawn so far ahead that the leaders of the race will encounter it. I find that it typically spawns at just around the halfway placement in the race, allowing those in the bottom half to slam into it for a golden shower of power. It's equally important to learn the Skyway tracks as much as it is the tracks themselves because depending on where you use your super boost can determine how much value you'll get out of it. All along the Skyway, there are boost pads which give you even more of a speed boost and allow you to surge ahead even further. You need to learn where these are. Using your super boost just past one of these or at a time where it will run up before hitting one will greatly diminish the return on your super boost investment. Not only that, but it's important to note that the Skyway can never drop you off anywhere that isn't a straightaway. It won't drop you out over out of bounds areas or on any turns. This is absolutely key in knowing where to best cheese your super boost so that it stays active for much longer than your meter would allow. The amount of wins I got because my super boost coasted me way further than it should have cannot be ignored. Learn the drop off points and don't just blow your super boost as soon as you get it. Yes, you could make the argument that for every second you're not using your super boost, you're wasting all the new super sparks you could be getting now. That and you'll lose your ability to boost since the super boost is activated by hitting the boost button when your meter's full. And I made these arguments myself a lot early on. Turns out I was a big dumb dummy, so learn from my mistakes. Holding on to your super boost and using it in key areas on certain tracks is the best way to get ahead. I'll just show you an example. On a track like Deathwind 1, which is just a basic oval, there's no place that feels really ideal since there's no track sections that are ever skipped. But if you learn where the boost pads are, you'll find that just before the start line hits, you can hit three speed boosters in a row where the people below will get nothing but dirt to slow them down. 
that and it ends in a big turn so you can get a bit of extra distance on top of the free boost that no one else on the ground level got. Super boosting is another incredibly fun mechanic that I welcome with open arms. Honestly, everything they did to this Nessa Original here was a huge improvement, but holy crap, the field of vision is by far the most noticeable. Look how far you can see in the original compared to 99. It's insane, and it's gonna make going back to this NES game really difficult, I can already tell. Everything is just so friggin' clean. The graphics, the frame rate, and the controls are tight as hell. Anytime I make a mistake that costs me, I know exactly exactly why. It's insane how well this game runs, on NSO no less, with 99 human beings connected through the internet. Sure, I imagine that someone else's reality isn't identical to what I'm seeing. There's been times where I slam someone around ahead of me and they rubber band right back. So there's some wiggle room in what reality is for each player. But at the end of the day, it's whoever has the best time that comes out as the winner. And that's something you can't fake. Something I didn't mention before when talking about the unlockables was tickets. You gain tickets by logging in each day or by completing races and earning points with every 500 points earning you one. Tickets allow you to enter into Grand Prix or Mini Prix. These are exactly as they function in the original F-Zero games or something like Mario Kart, for the most part. If you pay three tickets, you're entered into a five track series of races to see who can accumulate the most points. A first place win being worth 200 making a thousand the maximum you can get if you drive like a friggin' god. The interesting catch here though is that they chop off the bottom 20 players of every race each time. So only the top 80 get to the second race, 60 in the third, 40 in the fourth, and then ending in a 20 person race on the final track. This means that the vast majority of people entering a Grand Prix won't live to see the end of it. And I love how cruel that is. F-Zero has razor sharp teeth. And if you're afraid of being bit, you best go back to Mario Kart, pussy! Yeah. The Grand Prix are absolutely the biggest spectacle highlight of F-Zero 99, for a few reasons. One, like I mentioned earlier, any KOs you get permanently buff you for the entire time you're in it, which gives a real sense of progression. You know how much I love RPG mechanics and things that aren't RPGs. It's also the only way to unlock the gold version of whatever vehicle you win with. Seeing the leaderboards after each race and getting assigned new rivals to deal with in the next race is really exciting. Oh yeah, the rival system! Throughout your F-Zero journey, you're given a letter grade rank. This rank will go up or down depending on how many rivals you defeat in each race. Your rivals are decided by whoever is in the race that is directly two ranks above you or two ranks below you, meaning you're always going to go up against people that are as close to your rank as possible. This is genius, because it means no matter who is in the race, you've still got a personalized win condition just for you. Even if there are godly top tier players and kids who just downloaded this fun app that will make them cry in seconds oh. in the race, you you will always have a personalized mission to defeat your closely ranked rivals to increase your rank. Too good for you? <laughs> I knew it. Not only that, but at the end of a race, you're compared to the other racers that are within your letter rank. Meaning if there were eight A rank players in the race and you beat all of them, you get this nice little gold crown to show you're the best of your level. I think this is perfect design for a game like this. It's unreasonable to expect people to win every time given that there's 98 losers in every race. You ain't first, you're last. So having these personalized goals to incentivize people to improve and earn something without winning is such a smart design decision. In a Grand Prix or Mini Prix, your rivals will change depending on your placement in the tournament itself. Your rivals will always be the two people ahead of you or behind you, unless you're in first or second of course, in which case they'll just be below you. Grand Prix rivals are so fun to mess with, cause you just know! Both of you are looking at each other's placements on the scoreboard and thinking, yeah, that guy. Fuck that guy. Even without any verbal communication in the game itself, you can 100% feel the tension as you progress through a Grand Prix. It's F-099 at its absolute peak. You can't do these whenever you want though. Not only do you need tickets to enter them, but Grand Prix only run every hour during the week and every half hour on weekends. Mini Prix fill that void during the week running every half hour, which you'd think would be annoying, but I also love this. It builds the anticipation and also ensures that everyone will jump into the queue at the same time. If they ran perpetually, they would lose a lot of hype, excitement, and impact. Knowing racers are building up their tickets, watching that timer tick down until the Grand Prix starts makes it that much more special. I just can't get over how well designed all these little details are. This game is built so brilliantly, I'm truly dumbfounded. 
Between the Freeze, other modes are available to play around in. One being Pro Tracks, which functions identically to the 99 races, but are just done on the much harder tracks in the game. These do give you more ticket points, so if you want to stockpile tickets, be sure to get good at these tracks to grind out points quicker. The other mode being Team Battle, where half the racers battle the other half to see who can earn the most points from spin attacking each other, KOing the other team, and by just placing better. But wait, wait, hold on. Half? 99? I think you should do that math again. Here's a tip I'll give you right away. When learning the game, pick a single machine and stick with it. Myself, I went with my ideal self, Captain Falcon. How could I not? He's been my Smash main forever, and I play as him exclusively in X and GX. And I feel like if I didn't, I'd have to be against him. And that's terrifying. Now you all know the genius of the Falcon. Captain Falcon's Blue Falcon is the jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none machine. But don't let that deter you. It's still a fantastic vehicle. It has decent high speed, great acceleration, as well as a really fast recharge rate on pit strips and decent handling. I'm very glad I started with Falcon since he really is middle of the road when it comes to the other machines out there. Dr. Stewart. Man, this guy fucks. <laughs> Look at this. You know he's heading straight to your mom's place after the race. I became a doctor for the same four reasons everybody does. Chicks, money, power, and chicks. His machine, the Golden Fox, has by far the highest acceleration and recharge rate, though he's very frail and has the lowest top speed of them all. Can also be a little slippery on turns, but you can overcome all of that easily. The strategy with Stu is honestly just boost like crazy. Safely, but more than the other machines in the race. You almost always want to be near death before hitting the recharge strip, since the Fox will almost always get a full heal if you just stay on it. That, and be sure to take your corners tight and let off the gas entirely to take sharp turns. Since its acceleration is damn near instant, you'll get back up to speed very quickly after putting the gas back on out of a turn. You want to get ahead quick and stay there because the fox will get its ass eaten alive in a crowd just use that prescription pad of yours to juice yourself as much as you possibly can without blowing up i race for the honor more like to get honor am i right doc Pico, the curling master of the F-Zero universe, drives the wild goose. Huh, must be Canadian. This thing is your bully bruiser booty buster. The goose has the highest durability and takes very little damage from other racers. It also gets displaced the least when getting hit. You want to be the one hitting everyone else in this thing, since the rest of the vehicles can be quite frail. The goose also has the second highest top speed, but can have poor acceleration and its recharge rate is atrocious. Seriously, driving through a full strip might get you enough to boost once for an entire lap, maybe? This makes Pico especially dangerous if he scores a player KO and refills entirely on top of a max power meter increase. A gaggle of Picos that can boost and bully others off the track is a terrifying sight. I'm going to bathe the circuit in blood! <laughs> then finally, we have Pink Grandma. I mean, Samurai Goro. And let me tell you, when I was hunting for my win achievements with his machine, the Fire Stingray, I absolutely loathed driving in this thing. It has the absolute worst acceleration and durability in the game, meaning it is the prime victim for bullying. It also has a hit to full recharge rate, only slightly better than Pico. Knock this thing around whenever you can, because in order to recover from a big hit, Goro is forced to boost to keep his speed up. That is the Stingray's greatest strength though, its speed and handling. It is the fastest vehicle out there and has the tightest handling of them all. The power of two RS-5060 engines knows no equal. I like to call it a win more machine, since if you get ahead of the pack and you're a decent driver, chances are you're going to stay there. But it's incredibly difficult to get there if you're in the middle of the pack. I will say this though, while it may struggle in big groups, if you can get through the first couple rounds of a Grand Prix in the Stingray, its utility really starts to pick up since there's less muscle on the tracks and you're more free to race without fear of getting tossed around like a bitch. It's also much better on the pro tracks, assuming you are, because of its fantastic handling. But if you're going into the Thunderdome that is Mute City or Big Blue, yeah, 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 good luck out there. I've come around on this vehicle a bit though, and the more complex the tracks get in the future, the better it will be. Not to mention that the better skilled the player base has become since launch, the more Stingrays I see out there. Don't ever underestimate the comeback potential of Goro and his speed. If you find yourself ahead without any boost power left, he'll be coming for that ass. Now, I've got a few nitpicks. 
And there's not many, and they're really not a big deal, but I figure I should say them out loud in the hopes that they get fixed eventually. The music, while awesome, can be a bit repetitive. Don't get me wrong, I adore the F-Zero soundtrack to the moon and back, with Big Blue being my favorite track, but after playing the same track for the thousandth time, yeah, I wouldn't mind hearing something else, or hell, even some kind of remix or extended version, or have the ability to click like a radio button to change the track. Let me tell you though, anytime I'm on Port Town, all I can hear is that Smash Medley remix. Mix. King's Majesty broke out in the Silk City. Dwarf enemies ride the wind with no pity. Once more, the sea spreads itself before us. Towering the monsters, the heavens up above. Sometimes I'll just mute the game. <laughs> Mute City the game, and throw on the incredible F-Zero Jazz album on YouTube. Such smooth, soothing stuff right here. Or if I want a little more intensity, the F-Zero X arranged guitar album that's also on YouTube. Half the views on that video are from me, I swear. Another thing is that if you want to play and race against friends, you can, but it's not as easy as just partying up. Since this game is ranked, I imagine they didn't want you filling racing lobbies with your friends. But a technique I've used a lot is just queuing into the same lobby in synchronicity with people I want to race against. This works like 90% of the time in getting you into the same room, but it's a band-aid solution. The last couple of things I would consider me problems that are necessary for the game. But something I always do is try to use up boost before I get my super boost so that I can surge ahead, then hop on the skyway. But more often than not, I end up just using the super boost while swearing it wasn't full yet. I even caught this happening once. You can see in my power meter that I boost and my health started to drain, only for the game to go nope and sent me to heaven anyway before I even got to kill myself. Not sure if this is latency related, but I've burned so many super boosts in awful places just trying to use my normal boost first. That and the before mentioned red bumpers. You hate me, don't you? No, 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 I don't hate you. I just fucking hate them. A lot but I recognize that they need to be there. Otherwise, the races would be risk-free blowouts almost every time. As many times as they've screwed me over, they've also allowed me to take a dub that maybe I didn't deserve. Okay, before we end off, I wanna give you guys some quick tips that will hopefully accelerate your skill growth a little faster than mine was. Cause I really do want more people to try this game. So let's bring back... Tarvold's Behest! First, anytime you see a ramp coming, use your attack before it so that you can get another free one after hitting it. It will protect you from anyone trying to knock you off while using the ramp and allow you to hit someone after you land. That and always hold down whenever you're landing from a jump. This makes your landing soft and prevents you from losing any speed. Secondly, use the strafe. A lot, a lot, a lot. It doesn't cost you any speed and is a much safer way to get around bumpers and take corners. Speaking of corners, don't fear the shock of running over a corner. Taking the damage is most of the times worth it if it means shaving off some time and keeping your acceleration. Still be mindful of your health, of course. Third, don't be afraid to take off the gas. Almost entirely at points, especially on ice. Most racing games people just hold gas because gas means room. But whenever your machine starts to slide or you got hit by a bumper or took a bad corner, pulling off the gas will re-grip your machine to the ground, halting your slip slidey nonsense altogether. On big wide turns, you can even stutter your gas to keep your acceleration up because every time you let go, your ship re-grips. This allows you to take huge corners and barely lose any speed by stutter accelerating. Fourth, go for the blood hard. Those KOs are such big power swings, especially in the final couple laps. If you see someone smoking, take their ass out. Same with the silver bumpers. And this is doubly true if you're in a mini or a Grand Prix. Fifth, don't use your boost into a ramp. Your speed caps out when you're airborne and it kills all of your momentum. You can see here that my speed drops after hitting a ramp if I'm boosting and picks back up after landing. However, ramps will increase your speed if you're not boosting. So make sure to hit as many as you can to get a little extra zip. And lastly, as I stated before, pick a machine and stick to it. Obviously play around a bit at first so you know which one to choose, but seriously stick to one. It was hugely beneficial to me to understand how the tracks were laid out and how they interacted with my machine specifically. It's really nuts just how different each vehicle controls, and skipping between them hoping one will magically make you better ain't it. They're all good in their own way, but it's crucial to understand the game itself first before going into the differences between the racers. 
These tips should hopefully help you out a bit, but honestly, nothing is gonna make you better than pure old school muscle memory. It's gonna come with time and death. So much death. You're gonna die so much, dude, holy shit. But you will get better, you will improve, and eventually you will win. All right, first place. And it'll feel so amazing when you do, cause you'll know that it was all you, baby. And remember what Captain Falcon said. You don't win by being lucky. You win by being bold. And hey, if you see Tarvald out there on the track, be sure to come to this video and drop a comment and let me know. And if you beat me, definitely rub my stupid face in it. Lord knows I deserve it. If you had told me before this came out that one of my favorite games would use the free to play model, I would not believe you. And yeah, it's not exactly free to play since you need NSO to play it, but I think most of us who are playing F-099 kinda already had NSO. And it's genuinely shocking, but nonetheless admirable, that this game has no microtransactions at all. You can't buy skins, you can't buy tickets, you gotta earn everything you get, and I respect that so much. I'm hoping that F-099 has some legs and can continue to add content in the future and that it does get a physical release at some point. If stuff gets added in the future, hell, maybe I'll make a follow-up video down the line if there's enough interest. And if enough of you decide to stick around and sub to the channel. You should do that though. Do it. Please. As for right now, I'm starting to get withdrawal because it's been a while since I played and I'm starting to get the addiction itches. So let's just slap this into a tier list already so daddy can go get a hit. F-099 was a surprise delight and one of the best multiplayer experiences I've ever had in a series that's been dormant for way too long. Being a fan of F-0 is rough guys, but I'm happy to say that this game truly delivers on that feeling I've been missing for decades. F-099 belongs undoubtedly in the S tier. Huge thanks as always go out to my supporters on Patreon, including all of those shown on screen, along with Max Jez, Connor Bender, Ryuzaki Law, Star Fox, The Duke of Dorks, Husser, Redman, Pure Kong, The Wise Vivi, and Luigi Rules. You are all the grandest pre's to me. If you want to support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tarvoldsquest and check out the various tiers and rewards, including having your very own sprite emote created by me, or choosing a song in the next video game trivia episode. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you on the next quest. Finish!